Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see you here, uh, and I will just echo uh, his comments on the partnership and the conversations that have been happening on this stage here. Um, and uh, it's been a, a, a fun, uh, fun journey and a, a privilege. So anyway, welcome uh, to this morning's sessions. Uh, Matthew Slovic, I lead Morgan Stanley's Global Sustainable Finance Group. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but your clothing, what you're wearing today, uh, is actually one of the biggest contributors to your carbon and environmental footprint. According to the United Nations, the apparel industry uses enough fresh water to quench the thirst of 5 million people a year. It produces 20% of global wastewater and has a carbon intensity that exceeds aviation and shipping combined. It's also a major contributor to microplastics, increasingly part of the conversation. And that is why our next conversation, following the threads, mapping fashion's value chains, is so crucial. Because we see growing demands for sustainable solutions, we also know that from Morgan Stanley research, people are not willing to pay much more for it. It needs to be affordable. Only roughly 30% of people are willing to pay up to 20% for ethically sourced clothing. So reducing the environmental footprint uh, and social impacts of a clothing's lifestyle, of clothing's lifestyle requires innovation at scale to rethink and reimagine the status quo. And that is why, in addition to being a major business challenge, it also represents an opportunity for investors, for corporate leaders, for policymakers, to have a substantial role in formulating a more sustainable future. It's also why gatherings like this and conversations that are about to happen are so important uh, to, to moving this forward. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to thank you for, or I'd like to thank you as well for, for coming again today. And I'm pleased to turn the conversation over uh, to Abdi, Abdi Latif, the East Africa correspondent for the New York Times. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Matthew. Um, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm very eager to kickstart this session that is going to uh, focus on the clothes on our back, where, where they come from, and their role in climate change. Um, to start, I would like to begin with an exercise. Um, and I would like you to indulge me a little bit. Um, stay, uh, or raise your hand if you know what fiber your clothing is made of. Okay, I'm a little bit blinded, but yes, I can see you now. Um, and then raise your hand if you know where that fiber came from. One, two, three, four. Okay, thank you. The fashion industry's environmental impact is huge. Textiles production, including cotton farming, use 93 billion cubic meters of water annually. And this is set to increase following current consumption patterns. When we talk about clothing and fashion, we often think of retail and garment construction. But if we follow the thread, our clothing either comes from fr framing or, cr or crude oil, both of which have a huge climate impact. To discuss this and more, I have um, with me two uh, outstanding um, panelists. First, I would like to invite Lily Cole, who's an author, a filmmaker responsible for fashion advocate and a veteran model to the stage and Nagla Ahmed, uh, Social Development Manager at Sakim, an organization that works with Egyptian farmers, including cotton farmers, to disseminate organic and biodynamic agriculture. Thank you both very much for joining me. Um, to kickstart this conversation, I would like uh, each one of you to introduce yourself and your work, and maybe just talk a little bit about uh, one myth that uh, a lot more people believe about the fashion industry. Uh, so Lily, should we start with you? Sure, hello, good morning everyone. Um, thank you for having me. So I started modeling as a teenager um, 20 years ago and investing, investigating supply chains in that process. I started to become um, more cognizant of the, the ways in which business was impacting the world and trying to understand my role in that as a, as a, as a model at the time. Um, and what myth would I like to debunk? I think it's the, the myth of trends, the myth in a way of fashion being something fleeting and seasonal. Um, 
if we think historically, humans have for thousands of years wanted to adorn themselves in different ways, and I don't think there's anything negative about that. Actually, I think it's a very positive thing and can be very beautiful that cultures have tried to embellish and um, their individuality or their community's values through the way they dress, um, through practices around beauty, jewelry, etc. What is a more recent phenomenon is the idea that that expression needs to be regularly changed and updated. Um, and of course, that's being driven by this um, kind of like, <laughs> this ceaseless appetite of industry to sell more and more and more and waste more and more and more. Um, if you think of the fact that we have about 100 billion garments being made now annually, more than double what was being made 20 years ago, um, and that around probably three quarters of that very quickly ends up in landfill. If you Google images of the Atacama Desert, uh, clothes mountains, or Ghana landfill, you will see literally mountains of mostly new clothes, um, or you know, very recently new clothes being literally thrown away. And I think this is an issue that pervades every industry. Um, we see it in electronics, we see it in furniture, we see it in cars, that the planned obsolescence, designed obsolescence myth that we have to keep buying, 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 selling, selling, selling but nowhere is it maybe more obvious than in fashion. And I would love to question that myth. Yeah. Nagla? Um, my name is Nagla Ahmed. I'm working in uh, SECM, um, especially uh, in working with the uh, farmers in field, just to support them to uh, convert from conventional farming to organic farming, because demand on organic now is highly uh, increasing rapidly, and especially if we have the calculation of true cost accounting of the crops, uh, and cotton is uh, one of the main five main crops in Egypt, which is preferably worldwide. Uh, the demand is high, and the, uh, what can be sold will not be enough to fulfill 20% or even less than 20% of the needed in uh, global branding, like Lacoste and, and others, um, and people now like we mentioned, we are following the trend. People now are asking from, uh, from where we got our food, from where we got our clothes. This is very sensitive things which can be, uh, I, I need as a consumer to trust it and need to trace from where I can rest and eat my food. Uh, so as cotton, one of the crops which uh, uh, is turning to, uh, uh, to be, uh, high, or especially in Egypt, uh, to be turning in organic, uh, so we are working closer in different aspects with the farmer, uh, farmers just to convert them, not also in the, in the soil and the practices and how they can proceed this lifelong education uh, and learning process, but also to have a transformational mindsets uh, to convert their crops, not only cotton, but also their food sources. And given uh, this excessive consumption that you both talked about, could you talk a little bit about some of the challenges these farmers face uh, in terms of like... Yes, um, farmers, uh, cotton especially, is being cultivated in specific areas, uh, which is in Delta, and Delta already polluted uh, from water, from the air, and from already the soil. It's accumulated pollution from the um, unresponsible usage of pesticides. So uh, to get organic, uh, this means that the, the, the farmer has to follow some practices to convert from zero year in transition to reach third year, at least to get certification. Mm -hmm. It's organic. And not all to so this, it, it has to be assessed, it has to be supported from the organic input supplies. But now, as we have a worldwide challenges regarding the currencies, the inflation of prices, um, uh, other financial issues, fa the farmer has to find someone to support him of the extension services. He has to know from where he got, he got the good guidance, from whom. He should have trust. Then he would follow. He should, uh, 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 he should uh, 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 sell his product before producing. Otherwise, he will be scared all over the season how he can pay for something or give some attention or follow someone and he will not secure selling his product. Uh, also, uh, he has to know uh, from where to get the source of good seeds, good biofertilizers, good, uh, good uh, pesticide, good boost harvest issues because the harvesting issues and boost harvest treatments affecting the crop itself. 
um, uh, much more issues affecting the farmer, but at least the prices uh, and the input supplies and the guidance and marketing. If he finds someone to trace his value chain from this and accompany him, he would follow this uh, in a good way. Mm -hmm. But again, Delta is polluted, so research trials had been made in different places just to check uh, how it could be uh, tried in different varieties of cotton, especially the, the, the long uh, one. Um, but uh, again, um, challenges will be appeared uh, in different ways, but at least they can be controlled from this one. And now farmers are getting to know much more uh, information and uh, uh, because we are learning like by chalk. If we have a chalk, we have to take around or take corrective action. Um, so uh, the farmer now is facing what is the meaning of the climate change? What uh, affecting his crop since then? How he has to follow crop rotation in his farming? How to form like compost, like uh, a supporting to his soil of biofertilizer? And this also can sequester CO2 in his uh, soil. Later on, I will talk about the initiative. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I wanted to turn to Lily uh, because we'll come back to that in a minute, but uh, Lily, one of the things you work on is the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe's Sustainability Pledge, uh, which calls for greater traceability, transparency, visibility. What uh, pushed you to work on, on this initiative, and, and, and could you talk a bit about that? I was um, very uh, happy to see that the United Nations are making transparency a priority, and super happy to support this initiative, um, as you just mentioned. I think that trans I've long thought that transparency is absolutely essential in this effort that we're trying to make to transform industry. I've looked at it in fashion in particular because that's the industry I was working in, but I think it applies to every other industry. Um, and fashion is an interesting example because it's more often more complicated supply chains than, say, food, but maybe less complex than electronics. And, and so it's an interesting challenge to try and see how can we understand the supply chains and value chains in fashion. We're, of course, seeing so many different pledges being made by companies, by cities, by countries, we will have no idea if we are meeting those pledges, if we are making our goals, if we don't have transparency. Um, consumers and customers are not able to vote with their dollar, vote with their pound for better business if we don't have transparency that can honestly and authentically tell people how their products and, products and services are being made. Um, even businesses can't operate in that way, and I consult for some businesses, and it's been interesting to see that some of the companies that really want to transform their businesses, really want to kind of meet targets, struggle to because they don't have full transparency of their supply chain. They might have transparency for one, two tiers, but not all the way back to the beginning of the supply chain, um, as we've been discussing now, like Nicola was saying, with the actual raw materials and the land footprint. Um, Apparently, according to the, the, Europe, uh, the European Commission, um, the fa fashion in Europe is, is the third biggest industry in terms of land use. It's got a huge impact on water use um, that connects, of course, to farming, let alone petroleum, which is the, the main ingredient in some uh, modern fibers. Um, and if we can't track and trace those supply chains, how can we think about transforming them? Um, and there's a pilot that the UNEC is doing right now with Stella McCartney looking at um, cotton and regenerative cotton in Turkey and whether the blockchain can be used to do a proper transparency um, on many data points, but one of them, um, similar to what Nagar just mentioned, is uh, carbon captured by the soil. And I think that's really interesting because when you look at agriculture, uh, for food as well as for fashion, you see that it's a huge part of the problem we're dealing with today uh, with the climate crisis, um, particularly with regards to land use and water use, but therefore also a huge opportunity as a solution that if we transform how we use the land through agriculture, both for fashion and for food, we could actually galvanize climate action in an extraordinary pace and scale. Yeah. For practical purposes, uh, both you and Nagla were one of the few people in the audience who knew where the fabric came from and, and what fabric, what fiber, sorry, that you were wearing. Just for practical reasons, like how, how do you trace yourselves? Like what, what you're wearing and where it came from? Is, could you just talk a bit about that? I sort of, when you asked that question, like my hand was like, because mm, I could tell this country, but I couldn't tell the place. Okay. And that's, that's the reality that we're dealing with right now is that as somebody who cares, it's really hard to be really authentic about where it comes from. I don't know about you. 
Um, well, in SECAM, uh, we are trying to do something already uh, like an, a new initiative, and it's presented now in the COP mm -hmm. in different zones uh, and to our ministry and to uh, of agriculture, which is how to trace uh, uh, your product. And it's not only relevant to the farmer. Mm -hmm. It's a value chain coming from the farmer, a ginning mill, the weaving, the knitting, the printing, and to the final customer. Mm -hmm. How can this value chain all together do something? Is that the final consumer can buy the carbon sequestered carbon credits produced by those farmers. Uh, then the, 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 the final uh, consumer is supporting the source of production, helping them to be incentivized because some farmers already are selling their products at the minimal limits of pricing. Mm -hmm. But if he got some incentive along after he follows up some practice, this would be great, and then he can continue not only in cotton. Uh, some standard also, uh, like the economy of love, had to do the impact trace. Is that to the, if, through barcode of something, uh, of, of the product, you can trace from where your product is produced and from which district. Okay. Uh, and under the EOL, the economy of love branding, uh, you can trace uh, the whole value chain of the final product in your shelf then I know to whom I'm paying this my uh, money and to whom and where. And then I know from where I can get my food and my cotton. Mm. And this is what we are uh, doing right now to support the farmers from different perspective. Yeah. Uh, uh, the initiative is coming uh, back to support different things. First, the transparency and the trust between the consumer and the producer uh, uh, and along with the value chain. Second, to give an incentive to the farmer just to support him to convert to organic, uh, but to find his way uh, for production. Otherwise, he will not be converted because he, he will not see that this is his own responsibility. Actually, it's our own responsibility uh, uh, coming from work uh, in the value chain. Uh, again, uh, to support also from the government, from the organic law and uh, other stakeholders in the private sector. So from this, at least we can know from where we can get our products. Yeah, that, that's a great uh, detailed process. But I was just wondering in terms of like who to put the honest on. Is mm. it, should, be, should it be the government? Should it be the consumer? Should it be, you know, because uh, at the end of the day, like, you know, the way the system and the way life is structured now is that you're passing by these malls, there are all these flashy clothes. Everybody's just like excited to like pick them. Who should the honest be on? Um, um, from my perspective, it's, it's coming back from two, two partners in the beginning. Uh -huh. Like anything in life, we start with demo plot or prototype. It's from the private sector and the farmer. Then it's modeling. Now we are in the COP. We are different stakeholders from all over the world. If prototypes, successful one, presented to different stakeholders, now we are having instead of two, to have the trust will be three and four and five. And as I mentioned, now the final consumer can support, in, in Europe can support a farmer in the north of the Delta, in Egypt, or uh, uh, some uh, farmer in South Africa, because he trusts from where he will get his production and he trusts the, 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 the process of the, of the product. So it, it not will come uh, uh, suddenly, it's a, it's a process of trust and trust needs time. Mm. Like the mindset needs time to change. The soil has to, through the pesticides, to be organic almost in a three year. And to a Demeter, from four to five years, the mindset needs more. Mm -hmm. But I think trust needs uh, some proofs. Lily? <laughs> I think it's a really critical question. Um, and it's not a simple answer. I think that Consumers have, of course, a big role to play and are playing already a big role. Um, I think that in a kind of global capitalist framework, we can't underestimate the value that the kind of uh, force of consumerism has in terms of directing market trends and also influencing policy decisions. Um, and we've seen that already kind of working as a nudge factor in food, whether it's fair trade, organic, and now increasingly in fashion, um, with many, many reports suggesting that consumers, the majority of consumers care and will pay a premium for, for more ethical clothes. Um, that being said, I really think it should not rely, it should not, the responsibility should not lie on individuals and on consumers. I think this is fundamentally a pol policy issue. 
Um, if we look comparatively at an issue like slavery in the past, imagine if we had put all the onus on consumers to voluntarily elect not to buy products and use products that had slavery in their supply chains. We wouldn't have seen the movements against slavery happen in the scale and rate of pace that they needed to at that time. And I think it's similar today. We need the, the, the bar of what a minimum standard should look like um, to not include deforestation, to not include kind of driving the sixth mass extinction. That should just be a policy framework bar that consumers are not responsible for having to understand and deal with. Because right now, it's sort of a luxury to have the time, the headspace, and potentially the money to navigate these choices and make kind of ethical shopping choices that the vast majority of consumers don't have the mind space, the time, maybe the financial resources to do. Um, so I think this is where, yeah, policy has a really, really big role to play, um, of which there are many things that can be looked at, whether it's regulation um, or pricing and negative externalities. I mean, right now, a tiny percent of textiles are recycled. Um, the vast majority of new fabrics are using petroleum um, and not recycled petroleum. And why is it that the economic levers right now are making that the case? Because the cost to society, the genuine cost to society of not pricing in um, the pollution and the damage of, uh, of using these types of materials and wasting in this way is real, and it's just not being priced into the economy. So I think that's where the, the policy needs to, to really look to shift. Okay. Uh, I want to bring in a question from the audience, uh, an online audience. Uh, Bettina from California actually writes, what do you believe will help increase attention on the connection between fast fashion production and waste at the end of life? Sorry, fast fashion. What do you believe will help increase attention on the connection between fast fashion production and waste? Wake up. <laughs> the imagery's there. <laughs> like, just look it up. Just think about it. Mm -hmm. Like, throwing everything is precious. Everything comes from the earth. Mm -hmm. Everything that we touch and use has people behind it who are invisible, who are employed. Like, at what point did we start not valuing things and not valuing objects and not valuing the labor that goes into objects? You think about the history of fashion, it was predominantly women producing it. It's a very female led industry. It still is the majority female garment workers. It was about craft and textile. You still go to communities around the world where textile and craft is a big part of the culture that is valued. And at what point did we shift out of that into this disposable mindset where literally putting objects into the bin on a regular basis was normalized? So I think it's, my hope would be that we just start to think for ourselves and question the disposability of so many things in our lives, not, not just fashion, but all of the things that we touch and use every day need to be understood to be more precious because resources are finite and humans are also involved and animals in the making of these products. Yeah. Negra, there's also another question from an audience member, Adriana from Argentina, and she raised an interesting point. What kind of collaboration and support is needed for artisans and small businesses, people involved in local value chains, to validate their wisdom and sustainable practices? Um, uh this is, uh, comes, I think, from um, specialized, pro specialized programs to, uh, to the producers who are the small farmers uh, who have very small areas and do not know how to direct. Uh, this needs collaboration with some agencies. Here in Egypt, lots of programs from United Nations are directed to support the farmers, and not only United Nations, but it has to be directed to the uh, minorities area. Yani, we should not only focus on the same areas we are developing, like only Delta, like only uh, some govern rates in Upper Egypt. It could be directed to other areas who are having minorities of work, who cannot uh, access uh, selling uh, their uh, uh, products, even it's primitive. In, in some areas, some primitive uh, handmade uh, productions uh, can be sold in touristic area. And this is like uh, you are keeping the ecosystem is working and supporting their, uh, the, those um, minorities uh, to have their income and to create life in these areas instead of concentrating in some areas and all developing agencies are working in that. This is number one. Number two, it comes also from solidarities, uh, agencies and uh, the ministries. They, uh, they offer some programs, especially for women, who are not able to access uh, um, uh, some uh, suitable jobs in work. 
especially in the fashion, uh, and especially not only in the fashion, because women are representing huge workers in this uh, value chain, starting from cultivating till harvesting. Um, uh, so they have to be supported from uh, some education. They have like um, uh, to access uh, from a certain area. I don't know who are the certain area in, in Argentine, mm -hmm. but at least they can access education programs. Some people have innovative ideas, but they cannot access how to proceed, how to uh, uh, end up with a, a good product to be sold, or where, where, where how it can access the um, the marketing channels. So I think there are some directions, but they are from the agencies and from the government. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Can I ask a question as well? Um, Seekin was actually recommended to me as a project to look at in East Egypt that's apparently has amazing, done amazing work with biodynamic farming in, des in the desert landscape. Um, I'd be curious to know in your experience how you've seen the landscape transform through biodynamic farming and how scalable you think that could be globally. Um, uh, uh, nowadays, the, the, the organic farming are increasing, but still it's on the way. Uh, SECAM already started since 45 years with in transition of um, 500 farmers. Now already we're working with 2,000 farmers to support organic agriculture. Uh, and by 2023, we should reach uh, 40,000 farmers uh, uh, so that they can access organic agriculture practices in, from different perspectives. And what I mean here with organic agriculture, it's not only to convert the land, but also to convert their lifestyle, their families. Uh, they know what's biodiversity from a simple wording. Uh, they know what's climate change from simple wording. Um, they know how uh, to be educated and learning for the next generations. Um, now the farmer is a little bit um, uh, having um, educated mindset uh, to access markets and to less his cost and to search for the good channel uh, of marketing. So we are trying to, uh, to increase working with the farmers. But again, as you mentioned, it's not only second work. It has to be collaborative work with the government. It's, it's a must. We have to, uh, to work together. No one can work himself or individually. If SICAM succeeded in 500 farmers and 2,000 farmers, now with the new initiative of carbon uh, sequestration initiative to incentivize the farmer to increase his yields and to lower his cost, to increase the productivity, improving the marketing channels and do like a transformational change, but this cannot be, uh, will not be live a uh, long time. It has to be a community movement, uh, uh, support from the government, from the other private sector. Uh, concentrating in the same uh, uh, lands now, which is polluted, uh, is not the only way. So most of the uh, directions also to the desert, to the new desert lands uh, of Egypt, just to support, as I mentioned, other farmers who cannot access uh, clean agriculture and organic agriculture. For, uh, Sikam herself is an idea, is a vitality, but vitality is not living long if it stands uh, individually. Thank, thank you. Um, fashion and clothing is an important issue that affects us all. So I want to open up to the audience and see um, if we have a few questions. We're down to our last five minutes. There's a question here. Oh, okay. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the panelists. Thank you so much, Nagla, for raising the uh, challenges that happens in agriculture, especially in Delta region in Egypt. Um, even though agriculture is not my area of expertise, but um, I come from a family who were farmers and own lands in um, our, uh, in the Delta region in Egypt. And I'm really much aware of the challenges that, that, that they have been facing until they uh, sell the land and everything and they gave up on agriculture. Um, however, uh, regarding, but um, in my family, we, we, we have been um, telling a story all over the place about the cotton um, uh, um, uh, agriculture, especially that it was the main source uh, of their income back in the day. 
but um, it, it has been going through many challenges, especially in 60s, 70s, and moving forward until they gave up uh, on the uh, agriculture. So right now, um, what are the key challenge that you think cotton industry is still facing till now uh, to, flour to be more flourish in the future? Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, go for it. Uh, the key main challenge is the patience of the farmer. If he's not patient, he will not be converted. He has to follow some practice, otherwise uh, he would be conventional and waiting uh, to sell his product at the end of the, of the season after harvesting and all bad practicing, uh, inflation of the prices of the pesticides and by fertilizer and again and again he will cry after the, the season end and no more uh, activeness uh, after this. But with the small practices, as I mentioned, uh, he would convert and also get incentivized. Incentivized through selling his sequestered carbon credits, which is the new initiative, and it's disseminated now all over Egypt during the COP and before the COP through a standard called economy of love. This, uh, this uh, standard uh, offered the carbon credit uh, 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 certificate for the farmer, uh, he can uh, sequester the carbon through the, the soil matter already uh, and forming compost, uh, planting more trees uh, surrounding his uh, areas, regardless his areas, uh, and uh, also using uh, renewable energy. There is a cost, of course there is a cost, but again, the farmer can uh, make together with the surrounding neighbors like uh, a, a wall of trees. Then they sequester all the carbon. They can share in renewable energy. Now the cost of the diesel is increasing rapidly and still, still, and no subsidizing will be there. So the farmer cannot, at then this point, can move. He should move prior this uh, issue. Also, the, and while he is sequestered the carbon, he can sell what is sequestered already through this standard. This is transferring in the, in, into money. Now, uh, SECAM is working to be in the voluntary market to sell these carbon credits and refund again the farmer. But if we are in the official uh, 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 market, the increase of the sequester carbon will be more. And you know, the currency is increasing. So by sequester and by zero year, and this would be after so many years, the cost of the carbon would, mean, would be more and more. So we are working all this together. If the farmer is not convinced with this concept and will not follow some recommendation and follow up some things, he would be standing in his place. This is the main challenge, the patience of the farmer. Thank you, Thank Nagla. You. Uh, we're down to our last minute. And I know we started this session by talking about one myth that you wanted to debunk about fashion. And I wanted to end the session by asking you to talk about one truth about fashion that you want the audience to take away from the session. Mm. Lily? <clears throat> Good question. Um, well, they're connected because I think, for me, the, the truth we all have to contend with in fashion and in every industry is, is actually being truthful with ourselves about what is the reality of science right now, what we're saying in terms of pledges and promises, and what the data is showing in terms of action. Because there have been so many pledges and promises in the fashion industry and in every industry in recent years, and that's, you know, as an environmentalist for decades, that's encouraging to see that people are making promises. But then when you look at the data of year-on-year -year, um, carbon emissions, year-on-year -year growth, projected growth, it's completely out of line with the commitments that are being made. I mean, if the UN asks every industry to halve emissions by 45% by 2030, many fashion brands have committed to halve emiss their own emissions by 2030. Sounds great, and then you look at the year-on-year -year growth, and the projected growth up until 2030, and it's a complete delusion. Um, and so I think the truth I would call for is being truthful with ourselves, that pledges and promises are not going to deal with the physics. Like, the physics cannot be greenwashed. And we have to become really honest with ourselves, whether you're a CEO or a politician or a delegate or a consumer, about action. Um, otherwise, we're just kind of living in a bubble reality of conversation. Um, and we're not getting out of a crisis that needs, that needs to be got out of ASAP. Thank you. Nagla? 
I will not talk too much because I know time is up, but the same message, it's a matter of trust and belief. Uh, what I know, I have to believe in and have, I have to act with. It's time of no trust and action, along with the value chain. Fashion is a big, big, uh, a huge uh, uh, sector. A uh, lot of people are getting income through it, so from the farmer till the, the brand, high branding names, because they are buying a lot. So if all are believing in something, and there is a trust between all, things would a little bit uh, go better. But it's a matter of belief. And sorry, one last thing, I know we're out of time. On that point, just to be more tangible, like it's all very well companies thinking about new materials, but we need to think about new business models. We need to think about circularity. I didn't know where this dress is from exactly because I bought it secondhand. Like we really need to shift into circular business models and even questioning GDP growth as the religion by which we are governing our society and think about the metrics that we want to grow that are more important. <laughs> um, otherwise, we're not going to be able to be, I think, honest in making the changes that need to happen. Thank you, Lily Cole and Nagla Ahmed. Thank you both so much for being with us.